I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the background uh, and the goals. I'm going to spend more time discussing uh, the simplified model and give you some details around um, what assumptions we're making and, and how we're simplifying it, and then move right into this case studies, because uh, I think that's the most interesting part. Uh, again, if, if you're on this call, you probably know the what, the why, and the how for crystallization. Uh, but the big thing is you're going to take a stable solution uh, with your compound dissolved and destabilize it in some way. And when you do that, it's, it's usually by, the t by modifying the uh, process parameter. And when you modify the process parameter, you, uh, you change the physics in the system. And we're going to use some physical measurements, uh, namely solubility and some kinetic measurements to infer how those process parameters are going to affect the, uh, the crystallization. Really quickly, some useful generalizations. Uh, it's, it's relatively difficult to accurately model crystallization. You know, if you take a, a, a compound and you would like to predict particle size, um, you're, you're going to have to collect a lot of data and it's going to be um, a very rigorous process to get an accurate model. Uh, why do you want to understand crystallization? Uh, typically, and this is not just about API, in, in terms of uh, intermediates, when you're crystallizing for chemistry, you want to enhance your ability to separate, uh, purify, and also potentially influence product performance. Um, and in most unit operations, bigger particles are, are generally better. Um, and you generally get those by keeping your supersaturation low. So the problem is we need to balance the reality of uh, commercial processing with um, with the need to make bigger particles. So keeping supersaturation low usually entails slowing down the process. And when you slow down the process, um, in certain cases, you can make the manufacturing time unrealistic. Uh, and, and using these models and understanding the process is a way to quickly assess uh, what's, the, what's basically the best that we can do. So the, the goal going in was to create a really simple tool for, for scientists unfamiliar with crystallization to help aid them in experimental design. Um, and I'm going to hopefully demonstrate that this is useful for several different types of experimental design. So the first case study is on a uh, hemihydrate that's produced via recrystallization from um, MTBE heptane and water. So for this model, uh, you know, I've modeled the MTBE heptane as a single single solvent system just for simplicity. And uh, the, the unique thing about this compound was the water content has a, has a really large impact on solubility. So it was important to model that accurately before running the kinetic model. Um, we had no idea really to, where to operate this process. Um, and we had, a, we had some targets on the final particle properties in terms of specific surface area, uh, which was directly related uh, in this case to the, the habit of the material. Once the simulation is complete, you get a new result tab uh, with the entire list of simulated, simulated conditions. And uh, you'll see on the, all the way to the right your responses. And, and remember, this is what you wrote the word plot next to. So this is showing your max value, value of C minus C star during the simulation. This is showing you the max value of C divided by C star during the simulation. And um, it's going to be hard to tell here, but what I typically like to do is, is click on this guy and hit sort smallest to largest, and that way you can kind of see the range that you got. So this is um, this is also in percent, so that's 0.73 uh, in terms of the ratio, and it, you get values all the way up to around um, 400, so 400 times. So again, this is because we've turned nucleation off and forced everything to grow out. And they, and they correlate relatively well with each other, but I usually prefer to use the, the ratio. So you can visualize that data any way that you'd like. This is just the fit to, of the data uh, for the solubility and the, and the growth rate. So the growth rate here, you can actually see the last one was 0 0.015, and this is 0 0.2. So this, this compound has a very, very high growth rate. The other thing I noticed when I went and simulated uh, the first time around was uh, I was getting really abnormal numbers for some of the supersaturations in about one quarter of the experiments. Uh, and then when I, you know, this wasn't my process, I just kind of took it and plugged in the numbers and saw what happened. Uh, when I look, went and looked back at the, uh, the data, I noticed that, you know, one side of their design was actually in an area where all the seeds would dissolve when they seeded. 
Um, so I was able to pick that up in the model, revisit the actual data and see that, and then go back to the team and say, hey, you guys, we need to rethink this design. Uh, and so we came up with this new range to make sure that we would be in between the um, solubility and metastable zone width curve. Uh, it's something that you should do automatically, but um, it was it was nice that it was caught with uh, with the modeling. So you can see, except for this point here, that it it trends they trend with each other, meaning that the 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 growth rate that you, that you assumed uh, doesn't really seem to matter in terms of the the rank order predictions, um, except for this one out of place point up here, where the um, the low growth rate saying, yeah, I expect a lot of nucleation, but the high growth rate wouldn't expect it. So we're going to run a point at the low end, we're going to run a point at the high end, and then we're going to run this point where there's a discrepancy in our in our actual DOE run. So when we run those, what we see is with the uh, the conditions that we're most forcing in, in both simulations, we ended up with um, a primary particle size of around 30 micron. We put this in presentation mode so you can see it a little better. And then the, you see this hump here where there's some agglomeration occurring, mostly due to the amount of nucleation in the process and those nuclei agglomerating. With the least forcing conditions in both simulations, we ended up with a larger particle size, 55 micron, and a tighter distribution. And the thing I want to point out here is, yeah, these numbers aren't significantly different, but this, this material is acicular, so you know, Malvern data, a 25 micron difference is actually relatively um, significant. And then in the discrepancy, we actually see um, a, a process where we saw some nucleation and some growth. So you see there's a small hump here around um, 2 micron. We have 45 micron as the, uh, as the um, main particle size, and also there's some agglomeration indicating that there was some nucleation in the process. Um, what we can infer from that is that, yeah, okay, it's our actual kg is probably somewhere in between the two that we assumed. Um, but it, it, there was no surprises here, and we were able to design the process to um, to match these least forcing conditions and, and scale that up successfully.